between you and drinks stand I. All right, well, you can make it get spared. All right, I may or may not do much of this. Um, so I'm glad to be here with Vivian, uh, not only because we're friends and I have immense respect for Vivian, but also because we are both cockeyed optimists. And the question is, is there a new business model for news? By God, there are many new business models for news. We at CUNY um, uh, tr try to bring some specificity to this discussion because the discussion is usually mournful and moaning and oh my god we're doomed and your damn internet's killing us Jarvis and that kind of stuff so we decided to do some research on what would happen in a uh, oh, oops, 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 oops. Um, by the way this is all at newsinnovation.com you can find it there and if you're dizzy from this Prezi, it's called, you can blame Umer Haik, who was here last year, and this is through him here last year, and I discovered this tool, which is wonderful. So we wanted to look at what happens in a large market, top uh, 25, uh, let's say Boston, when the paper dies. I'm not trying to kill the paper. I don't want to kill the paper. I love newspapers. I have boxes of clips in my basement my wife would wish I would burn. I love newspapers. But let's face the devil full on. And, and so we looked at, the, at, at this. We... Um, So what we saw first and foremost was, and it's a duh moment, it's not as if the big old dumb news company is going to be replaced by a big smart new news company. It's already being supplanted by an ecosystem of many different players who operate under many different motives and means and business models. And we see this emerging today. So we looked at this from these four perspectives. Hyperlocal, the new news organization, the framework I'll describe, and yes, publicly supported journalism very briefly. The second important thing to take out of today was in our research on hyperlocal. I'm going to skip the slides now. Um, it's all online, but it's, it's much more detailed than you want. Uh, we went and did research with hyperlocal bloggers that exist today. And we found some across the country, not many, but some who are today bringing in $200,000 ad revenue, covering towns of 50,000 people. And mind you, these are journalists who don't know shit about business or selling or marketing, or business, or, or anything, right? Even so, in spite of themselves, they are starting to make sustainable businesses. We saw this as a mark of high optimism, that we saw the building blocks of the ecosystem in the future. We then looked and said, how do we optimize their businesses? And we saw three ways. One is that we need to improve what they sell to their local merchants. There's huge scale at this local merchant level to be had. Uh, but right now, we're still selling scarcity. Go back to this morning. Abundance versus scarcity. We in media sell scarcity. Uh, well, there is no more scarcity. It's gone. Forget it. So what we have to do, we, we've held a, a roundtable with ad salespeople at CUNY. It's the first phase of our next research and development on local advertising. And what we heard was salespeople listening to local sales, local, local merchants saying, basically, they don't want to buy banners and buttons. What they need is service. We have to move from selling scarcity to service. And that means we have to help a local merchant get up a good Google Place page and get into Yelp and figure out whether to use Twitter and so on and so forth. And so there's an, almost an agency role that takes over here. So improving the products that are sold is number one. Uh, number two is the creation of networks. So there are these individual bloggers who sit in a town who are bringing in this money, but they're on their own. If in this market there, you know, it's not a paper now. There's going to be a large amount of money available market-wide. Somebody's going to come together and create the quality networks that exist uh, to take some of that money. Also, f networks for towns around, or networks of moms, or networks of sports people, or whatever. Uh, getting a critical mass of audience up necessary to make this work will increase the value of these things. Then we also looked at new sales opportunities. What we're going to try to test with the New York Times and the local in Brooklyn from CUNY is the notion of citizen sales forces. What we know for sure is that newspaper sales organizations can't sell little tiny advertisers. It's too little. Uh, build it and they will come online. Tools do not work. We've seen that again and again. So maybe there are new opportunities, not just for citizen journalists, but also for citizen salespeople to start new businesses to sell these things. We'll find out and we're going to try. Um, and there's some level of cost saving to be had as well. So when we mock this out in our business models with business analysts, and mind you, the one thing we do know about any business model is that it's wrong, but we tried. 
And, and when we mocked it out, we saw that we took that $200,000 a year revenue business to 350. That person was able to hire three full-time people to do content in that town, was able to pay a cost of sale equivalent to one and a half people, and was able to bring home $120,000 a year after being an unemployed journalist at a newspaper. That ain't bad. And so my students at CUNY, where I teach entrepreneurial journalism, are also right to now say, well, teach me to do that. And as well, we will soon coming up. So we see that as a building block of this new future. That's the first. The second is the new news organization. We still see a news organization in a city like this doing metro-wide reporting, beat reporting, which is the most important thing, investigative reporting. Many fear that investigative reporting will be the first thing to go. Well, those are foolish organizations that do that because investigative reporting still gets attention and brand value. Uh, we think that what suffers most, uh, Vivian mentioned this, is things like statehouse coverage, broccoli journalism. Now, here in New York State, of course, that's very sexy, but in most states, it's not. Um, so we still see this new news organization. We see uh, it selling the metro-wide advertising. At the end of three years, we projected 46 content people, 90 total people. Now, in that, you see a real important view of why newspapers are dying. In that, you see the business model for Politico Local, that Jim Brady, who was at the Washington Post, is now going to run a local brand of Politico, and he's going to have, I think, 25 reporters, right, roughly. Uh, he's going to have an association with a local TV station, and he's going to be able to build a profitable business at a very low cost. Our theoretical business had a total number of employees of 90. Well, the Washington Post has 750 people in the newsroom alone, probably 2,000 people total. The pain and struggle and cost for the Washington Post to shrink down to this new level of small that works online is probably insurmountable. But the ease for an entrepreneur to come along and build something from the ground up and become profitable rather quickly, especially if there's an infrastructure to help them, not bad. And so that's what we see happening here. I don't want to lose the Washington Post. I don't want to lose the value of the Washington Post. Indeed, I propose to the Washington Post that they should, every time they've laid off people, they should offer them a blog and a business and promotion and ad sales. Those are brands they created, trust that they built, that walks out the door. And in fact, it's just a new way to think of their compensation relationship with that journalist. And once you've gone there, what you've really done is created a network. And I think that networks are the new structure of where we go here, uh, networks that enable independent agents to create their own businesses and succeed together. The third element here is what we call the framework. Somebody needs to put together these networks so that every, all these ships can rise on the tide. Uh, we envision a company to do that. Um, there's a, a man named Mark Potts who started Growth Spur, who's starting a version of that now in, in Growth Spur. Finally, we looked very briefly at the notion of public supported media, and we didn't look very hard at it. We just said, if you were in a city like this, you had $3 million, what should it go to? The important thing for discussion on this, and you're marketers, so you may not care as much, but just for a minute, is that I think that we shouldn't necessarily come in and say, let's take over news in the town from a not-for-profit structure. Because in San Francisco, for example, there's a lot of controversy that this not-for-profit organization is going to kill the Chronicle sooner, and is going to affect the tender sprouts of entrepreneurship that are growing up. The question we should really ask is, what won't the market support? And that's where public support can best be used. And not just in coverage, but also in things like training and promotion and infrastructure. And Vivian and I have talked about this, and I think that NPR and uh, public uh, TV as well stand in a great position to use their space, promotion, uh, uh, respect, uh, educational ability to help the ecosystem overall. That's where I would put that money in that. Let me add it all up. At the end of the day, in Boston, New England Media Corp, a, a division of New York Times, obviously, last year brought in $400 million. Our total ecosystem, when we add it up, added up to about uh, $45 million, which means it's a rather defensible number because most newspapers in this country are getting between 10 and 15% of their revenue digitally. So for that defensible number in the marketplace, we thought we could support an ecosystem. And that ecosystem, had in it 250 journalists versus about, what, 300 in that, in that newsroom now. But they don't work in one room anymore. They work for 100, 150, 200 different companies spread all across the area. Many of them are owned by the journalists who, who are working on them, who are building their own value. 
but you have an equivalent journalistic resource that is now closer to the community, more answerable and accountable to the community, and we think that could be potentially an improvement in the journalism. Um, and we see huge potential for growth because part of the assumptions we made, one of the assumptions we made was that these sites get 12 page views per user per month, which is what news sites in the US tend to get, and that is sinfully, criminally, horribly, shamefully low. 12 page views per user per month versus 12 page views per user per day at Facebook. If we think news organizations are truly of the community, it's bullshit. We're putting out content one way. We are not collaborative with the community, uh, as was mentioned this morning as well, and I think we have huge opportunities there. So I want to switch off for one second. I promised you the end of PowerPoint, but I lie. Um, and I just want to go to a stupid little uh, uh, slide of mine here. Okay, I'm a professor and I make stupid little slides. But I think w what we have to do is, I, I, my students all the time, I try to break open, they come in with the assumption of media that we all have, that we built, and we've got to break open all these assumptions. When I presented the new business models for news at the Aspen Institute, Marissa Meyer, the uh, head of uh, user interface and search at Google, said, okay, Jeff, all this talk of hyper-local content is fine. But she said, where I think the world is going is to hyper-personal news streams. And we all have those streams today, right? We have our email, our Twitter, our RSS, our Facebook, uh, headline updates, uh, uh, SMS, all kinds of new things coming. And Marissa Meyer sees a, an opportunity to help prioritize that for us, that we become algorithmically aided humans here, that our, our email from a boss goes to the top, a story we've, we've looked at the last five days, don't look at today, there's huge news, you better know about this. There are ways to, to guess on this. What I said this morning in a question, that there are those who are trying to replicate the serendipity of news, which is really an editorial-centric thing. I tell you what you might want to know. Right? Serendipity now comes from places like Twitter and so on, and I think there are ways to aid that. So what I thought about here was, where do we get to news and content? In the past, there was only one way, brands. By that, I don't mean your brands, I mean media brands, right? That you went and bought the paper, you listened to the show, you watched the show, that's how we got news and information. Then along came search, which changed the order of the relationship. It started with the user, the reader, the whatever, who asked the question. And if we have an answer, you might be found. That didn't do very well for current content, AKA news, because Google needs content to ferment like wine or cheese with our clicks and links. So along came algorithms, which were better at dealing with current content, Google News or Day Life, where I'm a partner. But now we're seeing this huge power growing of human links, us again, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. Google as a whole causes four billion clicks a month to publishers. And by the way, when Eric Schmidt said that in the Wall Street Journal, he also pointed out that it is then up to those publishers to build a valued relationship with those people Google sends them. And if they don't, Mr. Murdoch, it's your own fucking fault. It's not Google's fault. Google's not the enemy there. Google is sending you people, and Murdoch calls them worthless. When I quoted that in my blog, one of my British readers said, oh, how wonderful to know that editors think we're a bunch of useless asshats. These are relationships, the value is in the relationship. This is, by the way, why I object to the New York Times paywall, because they haven't begun to get the full value out of that relationship, and they put up a wall. But anyway, so human links. Google causes 4 billion clicks a month. Google News causes 1 billion clicks a month. Bitly, the URL shortener on Twitter, causes alone 2 billion clicks a month, double that of um, Google News, half of that at Google. Now, mind you, all those don't go to publishers. Many go to cat videos. So it's apples and oranges. But nonetheless, we see the power of us. We also see, uh, Vivian mentioned, uh, uh, demand media, predictive content. Demand's insight is that it listens to all of our search requests, also looks at the economic value of a, of a, of a topic, and then writes a headline and says, if you write something under this, you will make money. Now, that can be offensive to an editorial ear, but it's very important the man saw the ability to find a new way to listen to what we need and serve that, which we didn't do in news. That's new. Finally, I, will too, will quote, uh, will quote Clay Shirky, I'll drink up, and, and he talks about the need for algorithmic authority. My point of this silly little chart is that our world was very simple in the past. We had brands, they were magnets, people came to us to get the news. It's over. 
It's gone. It's finished. It is no more. And we have not even begun to rethink what news really is in a streamed world. I just had to write a piece for a German publication and, and, and was talking about local. What's the definition of local? Local's not a one-size-fits-all, five-million market publication. And it's a challenge for, for, for a local NPR affiliate as well. Local's not for everybody anymore. It's figuring out this. So local in the future, I think, becomes synonymous with mobile because local means what's around me now. Right? What do I care about where I am? So imagine you go out to a club down on Broadway and you use Google goggles on your Nexus One phone. And I can take a picture of the club and that becomes a search result. Right? I don't even have to type or say anything. And that becomes a search result. And I want to know from Google, what do you know about this place? What's the menu? Who's playing tonight? Can I hear that? Have my friends gone there? Query uh, Foursquare, query uh, Yelp, query uh, Google Buzz, query Facebook. Who's been there lately? What do they have to say about that? Who's there now? Give me a coupon. Give me a deal. Tell me how many people order the crab cakes. Why not? Right? The amount of data that occurs around that, it's not as simple as, here's a news story we chose to write for you. It's what's relevant to you. And, and those are huge changes that we have not, again, begun to grapple with. So my problem is that if we look at the value of what we have in media going forward, it's not that we have content. It's that we've had relationships. And those relationships, as Vivian said in the trust numbers, aren't very good. And others are going to come in and do this. I visited Best Buy uh, two weeks ago, where I'm full disclosure, I'm consulting with them now and again. Wonderful, amazing company. And uh, they tweeted this, so I feel free to say this. But they're looking very seriously at Best Buy as a media company. Best Buy Circular has ads and content in it. Best Buy sells the end caps in the store. Best Buy sells positions in the store. Best Buy now has a media kit and salespeople to go off and sell pretty amazing things in Best Buy. Best Buy, I think, then needs to think about content and relationships with people and getting relationships from people from their customers and their expertise and all their blue shirts and all their, their, their geek squad people and so on and so forth, right? So Best Buy is a formidable media company. At the same time, talking about new business models, the Telegraph in London is becoming a retailer. Retailer becomes media company, media, tailor, uh, uh, media company becomes retailer. So the Telegraph sells merchandise directly to its readers. For example, the Telegraph is the leading retailer of clothes hangers in the UK. True. Now, my, my theory about this is the Telegraph readers, being Tory conservatives, like to hang their suits neatly in the closet. My Guardian colleagues, I write for the Guardian, are liberal, and we just throw our jeans, as you can see, under the bed and don't care. So they sell clothes hangers, Panama hats, Imagine now this picture of a natty telegraph reader walking down the street with the bumper and the t Panama hat and so on. Uh, garden sheds, wine, sports bedding. They don't like to spread this, but they also sell a lot of knee braces, which is a demographic statement. The point is that the telegraph is finding other relationships with these readers. Other places are, the, 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 the Times just started selling wine. Uh, some, some news organizations are doing education, which is an opportunity, and the only thing that's saving the Washington Post company right now, by the way. Um, there are other opportunities when you have a valued collaborative relationship with people. There are also, as Vivian hit on, which I barely hit on, huge cost savings to be had. We are wildly uh, inefficient in this business. Uh, I think we have to operate under a rule of do what you do best and link to the rest. And if you go to Google News, put in a story today, and you'll find 1,200 stories. That's waste. It also, in a link economy, does not drive traffic to the original content, which we have to do morally, I think. So we have to rethink how the architecture of news works, how the architecture of media works, what our relationships are, where our value is. And our value is often not just in advertising, though it will be primarily there, or certainly not, I think, in paywalls, because that cuts you off from too much. It will also be in other parts of the relationship, including, by the way, ways to save money because you work collaboratively. I'm at two seconds. One last thing. When we presented these models at uh, uh, Aspen, Sue Gardner, the head of the Wikimedia Foundation, said that they had calculated the value of just the edits, just the edits in Wikipedia. And they, they won't let me say the numbers attached, because even they can't believe them to an extent. But they ascribed a low per hour value to the edits. And they found that it multiplied up to a value of hundreds of millions of dollars a year. There is this incredible asset that cr is created that Clay Shirky will be writing about in his next book. Um, 
uh, about how when we stop watching TV all the time and take a little bit of time, we can create an asset like Wikipedia. Well, if we have news organizations are truly of our communities, we will become platforms to create these incredibly valuable assets and not just spew out content and think that that is going to bring in the world. Okay. Thank you.